Wonder if prices will ever come down. Fed up with the post-war world. Want to get away from it all. We offer you escape. You are standing at the edge of an enchanted grove. Lured by a soft, caressing voice inviting you to destruction, you have nearly sold your soul to an ancient goddess from whom you must escape. Escape, produced by William N. Robeson and designed to free you from the four walls of today. For a half hour of high adventure. Today we escape to the African veldt and an enchanted shrine of great antiquity. As John Buchan told it in his weird story, The Grove of Ashtaroth. Stumbled onto the place, Lawson and I, during the second day after we left Taki. We'd travel on horseback some 40 miles or so through typical African veldt, lush and green, with plenty of game and good hunting. It was late afternoon when we topped a rise and saw before us a small plateau of such beauty that we both reined in and sat staring at it, not speaking for some moments. A tiny, sparkling stream wandered through the verdant meadow grasses, and at the edge of the plateau tumbled in a crystal waterfall down to the plain below. Graceful clumps of strange trees grew here and there, and bushes blazed in a riot of bloom. I'd seen nothing remotely like it in all the miles we'd come. It stood alone, proud and lovely, an alien island in a sea of tropic jungle. Great heavens, John, in your whole life have you ever seen anything like it? If some artist had designed that plateau, placed every tree and bush by hand, it couldn't be any more perfect. It's... it's almost weird, isn't it? Yes. It shouldn't be here. It doesn't belong. But there isn't a plant growing over there that's like any we've seen in the rest of the jungle. Uh, Probably a difference in minerals in the soil, something of that kind. Mm, It's more than that. They're not even the same varieties. That's true. That one grove standing alone there near the edge, I... I've never seen trees that slender and fragile. And the bark, it looks like silver velvet. Silver velvet, huh? <laughs> That's quite an idea, John. Hmm? Yes, <laughs> I guess it is at that. Anyway, those doves seem to like it. They never stop circling over that one particular grove. They're probably nesting there. A flock of white doves circling over a silver grove. But, you know, there's something vaguely familiar about that. Yes, there is. John, can you make out some kind of a dark shape there through the trees over toward the center of the grove? Yes. Yes. Come on, let's ride over and take a look. Hmm? No. Uh, not, not now. Huh? Why? I mean, uh, you'll have plenty of chance to see it later. What are you trying to say? John, I'm going to build a home here. A home? Out here in the middle of the jungle, miles from... I'll the... build a road in from Taki. I've got money enough and no one but me to spend it. I've always wanted to live in Africa. Always, Lawson? Or for the last five minutes? It doesn't matter. Somehow, even though I'd never seen it, I've dreamed of this spot all my life. I've got to live here. Uh, want to live here, I mean. But so quickly, at least think it over first. No, I don't have to think it over. I know what has to be done. John, it's here that I build my tabernacle. I I couldn't understand Lawson giving into this sudden foolish impulse. It wasn't like him. But there was nothing I could do. I left him at Taki the next day and returned to the matter-of-fact world of business in London. And it was three years before I saw him again. Three years before I returned to Africa to find that he'd built a manor house in the jungle and equipped it with all the conveniences of the English countryside. 
of which not the least was Travers, his butler. And may I be so bold as to say, Mr. Buckham, it's very good to see you again, sir. You bring a breath of old London out of this heathen foreign country. Oh, well, thank you, Travers. It's good to see you again. This is some different from the old granite front on Grosvenor Square, isn't it? Indeed it is, sir. A great many things are different. Yes. Mr. Lawson's turned this jungle clearing into a paradise on earth. Uh, if you'll pardon me, sir, I think paradise is not quite the word. Hmm? Oh, well... Uh, uh, perhaps I'd better tell the master you've arrived, Mr. Buck. He's been lying down. Oh, not ill, I hope. Uh, I'll tell him you're here, sir. Travers left the room and I waited alone, wondering at the strangeness of his manner. I had finally decided it must be induced by homesickness. I looked about me, as impressed by the austere magnificence of the library as I'd been by the grounds outside. There was an imposing mantelpiece of ebony at one end, and on it was placed an object elegantly fashioned of alabaster in the form of a half moon was curiously carved with signs of the Zodiac. There was something compelling, almost unearthly about it. Fascinated, I reached out my hand. I should not touch that about you. Huh? Oh, Lawson! I didn't hear you come in. How are you, Chuck? Oh, fine, Lawson. Couldn't be better. You? So we sit down? Why, yes. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful seeing you again, old man. Been wanting to get down here for the last three years, but you know how it is in London. Time gets away from you, and the first thing you yes, know... Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, cigar? No. No, thank you. Not now. When I finally did get the chance, I couldn't even wait for an answer from you. I sent a wire and then followed it right on down. Yes, it surprised me a bit. I haven't had a visitor here for the last two years. Oh? Well, then that explains why Travis talked the way he did. I thought it must be... What do you mean, Travis talked the way he did? What did he say? Lawson, what's wrong with you? He didn't say anything. Well, it's better not. Uh, I'm afraid I... Forget it. I... I'm sorry, Chuck. I haven't felt very well the last few days. Well, that explains it. I say, at least you seem to be eating all right. You're actually getting a bit plump. Actually, I'm fat. Gross, flabby, and obscenely fat. Isn't that what you really mean? Well, no. I was only joking. Never mind. Uh, what do you think of the place, John? The place? Why, it's amazing. It's beautiful. No one could ever believe it without seeing it. I, I doubt if there's another place like it anywhere in the world. You're right about that. There isn't another place like it anywhere in the world. Oh, that reminds me, I... I noticed you left the grove as it was without bothering it. Tell me, did you ever find out what it was we saw that afternoon? Yes. Yes, John, I found what it was. Well? John, I have an overseer here, name of McJobson, quite a competent man. I want you to leave with him in the morning, take a three- or four-day hunting trip. He knows the country. He'll find you plenty of game. Oh, but I... I came here to see you. I... I'm fighting about a fever. It happens every so often. I'll be all right by the time you get back. Oh, now, wait a minute. If you're sick, I'm certainly not going to run. You'll do what I tell you. Lawson. Uh, I'm sorry to talk this way, but I know what has to be done. All right, Lawson. Whatever you say. Good. Settle it. Believe me, John, I know what's best for me. Yes. I'm sure you do. Another thing, John. That carving that sits on the mantel, I must ask you not to touch it. It's quite old and rare. I should not like anything to happen to it. That night when I retired, I found it impossible to sleep. I tossed fitfully, trying to think of some reason for the great change that came over my friend in these past three years. Drugs, drink, actual sickness, either physical or mental? No, none of them gave any complete answer. My windows looked out across to the turf, and I saw the grove of strange trees. It was bathed now in the moonlight by a soft, silvery haze. Even now, in the middle of the night, the flock of doves circled in the air above it, gleaming white from wing and breast as they wheeled in the shafts of moonlight. 
I dozed off finally to wake up suddenly in that brief hour before the first light of dawn. I happened to glance from the window and in the fading moon glow saw a figure approaching the house. It drew nearer and I saw it was Lawson, barefooted, wearing a white dressing gown. Shortly I heard his weary steps pass my door and afterward the house was silent. I lay there wide awake. Lawson had been coming from the direction of the grove. Good morning, Mr. Buckin. <coughs> oh, morning, McJobson. Oh, sit down, sit down. Thank you, sir. Now, in regards to that hunting trip we talked about, I, I can offer you a choice of two or three... No, no, of... never mind. I'm not going on any hunting trip. But last night we decided that... That was the... last night, McJobson. Tell me, how long has Mr. Lawson been sick? Oh, it comes and goes. Happens about once a month like this. He's not the man that he was when I first came here. Do you have any ideas about what might be the matter? I? Well... What are they? If I told you what was in my head, you'd think me daft. Why don't you wait until tomorrow? You won't need to ask. It's the full moon, the next. Full moon? What does that have to do with it? You'll find it in the Bible. Read the 11th chapter of the second book of Kings. It says that. I found a Bible in the library and thumbed it open to the passage he'd mentioned. I read through it once without understanding. And then, one sentence seemed to leap out from the page. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians. Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth, of course, Ashtaroth. Goddess of the ancient East, whose strange rituals held a dark fascination for the children of Israel over and over, luring them away from their fierce prophets to worship at her shrines. The white doves of Ashtaroth circling the shrine of her silver grove. Why, then the grove at the end of the turf must hide a lost shrine dedicated to her worship. But what of Lawson? Did his blood carry one fraction from old Israel with the same ancient weakness to hear and answer the call of the goddess? Did he become an acolyte of Ashtaroth? What weird rites did he perform in the grove at night? And then I remember tonight. The worship of Ashtaroth had always reached its climax on the night of the full moon. Lawson did not appear all day. And that evening, after dinner, McJobson and I took up our watch on the dark veranda, looking into the windows of the library. We'd been there at least an hour. When... Look. That's Mr. Lawson. He just came into the library. I see him. Hey, what's he after? Gosh, I suppose he wants the little figure on the mantel. We watched him take the carved half moon of alabaster and slip it into the pocket of the robe he was wearing. Then he turned and left the room. In a moment, he came out the front door and walked off across the turf in the moonlight. The best give him a bit of a start. I'll then follow it. No, he'd see us for sure in that moonlight. I uh, do not think so. He'd not look back now, sir, if there were ten of us following. But, Jobson, what is it all about? You've read the book? Yes. Yes, it's the ancient goddess Ashtaroth. But what is the ceremony? What does he do? And what is it that made him the way he is? The ceremony you'll be seeing, Mr. Buchan. As to what has made him like he is, he does an evil thing. And all the while he knows it to be evil. He cannot help himself. And he knows that, too. Yes. I think I see what you mean. We'd best be going now. He's gone into the grove. We crossed the turf quickly and passed into the black and silver shadows of the moonlit grove, working our way carefully toward the center. The only sound at first was the piping of the doves circling high over the lacy branches above our heads. I saw as we approached that the center of the grove had been cleared to form a small circular arena 
was covered with smooth turf. And standing in the middle of it was a cone of rock 30 feet high, a smooth, sharp tower of stone that pointed up toward the tops of the trees. And then I saw Lawson. He stood by the base of the conical tower, his arms uplifted, the symbol of the half moon bound to his forehead, enchanting words with meanings I could not even guess. Now Lawson threw off his white robe and began a curious kind of dance, moving around the foot of the cone on a worn path beaten in the turf, the same path he must have followed many other nights before. He moved faster and faster, uttering now and again a wild cry. We stared entranced at the circle of moonlight. And as he danced, a strange new sound slipped into my consciousness, an earthly melody that seemed to come from from the tower, from the trees, or may perhaps have been born within my own mind, tricked by the magic fantasy of moonlight, shadows, and perhaps madness. It brought to me one vivid thought of the warm, soft lips of an unseen goddess, of lips incarnadine, whispering gently and sensuously across the reeds of a penpipe. I, I stirred uneasily, felt the quickening of my pulse. If I try to resist it, Mr. Buchan, it is only a thing of evil cloaked in a false beauty. Uh, my Jobson heard or felt it too. Then it was more than a trick of my own senses. Something in me thrilled to the call of the weird melody. I, uh, I wanted to rush out and throw myself at the base of the stone tower to dance as Lawson was doing. To spend all eternity in adoration and worship of the beauty of Ashtaroth. Oh, Mr. Buchan. Think what it's done to him. Fight it, lad. Fight it. I lost all knowledge of time. The dance had grown swifter and fiercer. The moonless figure in the clearing moved faster and faster, posturing and gyrating in tempo to the crazy rhythm. My blood was pounding in my throat, my ears ringing. The music surged through my brain in ever-mounting waves of incandescent sound. Now I was beyond reason, possessed by an overpowering frenzy when... The cock crew... Then the grove was deathly still, and at the foot of the tower, Lawson lay unconscious. How is he, Mr. Buckham? Mm, he's lost a lot of blood, but I think he'll be all right. Good. That was a near thing. Travis got a couple of sleeping tablets into him. He'll not be waking up before tonight, at least. McJobson. I suppose you know what we have to do. I'm well aware of what should be done, sir. But I've no idea how to do it. I think I do. I shall take full responsibility, but I'll need men, all we can get. The natives will no go near the place. But there's some 30 white men on the tobacco farm a few miles back on the bush. But the water highway... I'll pay it, just get them. Would you mind telling me what you're proposing to do, sir? Yes. Something that may sound as mad as Lawson himself. I'm going to deal with that grove the same way King Josiah did. Ah. Hey, it comes back to me vaguely. Yeah. Here it is. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Sidonians, did the king defile. And he break in pieces the images and cut down the groves. Both the altar and the high place he break down, and burned the high place, and stamped it small to powder, and burned the grove. Aye, it is the word of God. I need dynamite, but I have plenty of it down at the workshop. I'll go after the men first. We should be ready to start by nine o'clock this morning. It was just past nine when we entered the grove, carrying axes and a couple of shotguns and driving several teams of oxen. 
A light breeze had sprung up and it whispered and rustled in the branches of the silver trees. We took care of the doves first, shot them one by one until we'd killed them all, 27, then piled their white bodies at the foot of the pointed rock. Then the men set to work with the axes, chopping through the slender trunks of the trees. Drop the single tree, get every bush, drag them into pine. Right to our left. All right, come on. I stood by the stone tower, the high place of King Solomon, and watched while the work went on. Gradually, gradually, born perhaps in the sighing wind, a, a strange fancy crept into my mind. Oh, no. Please don't. Please, no. I fancied I could hear a voice coming from the tower, from the trees. This voice was soft. Warm and pleading. Listen with your heart. Can the spirit within you not hear and feel? The heart of all sorrow was in that voice, and the soul of all loveliness. Distant, tenuous, with all the bodiless grace of a goddess older than time and desire. believe that I was imagining this soft and lovely voice. I felt a sudden and overpowering adoration for this exquisite creature who whispered in the breath of the wind. I wanted to call out to the men, order them to stop desecration of her home and sanctuary. Then I thought of Lawson, of what he'd become, and I fought back the impulse. How can you judge who knows so little? One who is part of the whole divinity of nature. No. No, I won't. I can't listen to you. Look at me but once with the eyes of your heart. And you'll belong to me forever. No. Please, no. You have killed my dove. Covered their white breasts with blood. Are you not yet satisfied? It's got to be done. It's got to be done. No, please. You could stop now and leave the high place. New trees would grow. The other doves would come and nest in them. But I can't. I can't. What do you say, Mr. Buchan? Uh, I couldn't quite hear you. Hmm? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Well, I'm ready to put the dynamite around the tower here. If you'll move back a little way. McJobson. McJobson, perhaps... Perhaps we could leave the tower. Maybe it's enough to clear the grove. It is not enough. The book says, And their children remember the altars and the groves by the green trees upon the high hills. No. That's no good, Mr. Buckham. They know heat of the voices of the wind. Every last stone must be destroyed. He is a stern man and a cruel man, and his words are vile with hate. No. Believe me, only this one last course. No. All right, Miss Jobson. Go ahead with it. Place the boxes of dynamite close together, lads. Easy now. No. Even now, it's not too late. I... I walked away slowly. The piles of tree trunks were burning now. The smoke swirled in the wind. I would leave this place tonight. Yes. I would leave this place forever. Then write a note for Lawson. Telling him of what I'd done. And I was very tired. Yet time, the thing once done can never be undone. And once 
gone. I can never return. I... I knew. I knew that my act, my reason told me all these things. I knew that this act that I'd committed had saved Lawson. It saved his life and perhaps his reason. And yet I wondered if perhaps in so doing I was not driving from its very last refuge on earth. Something that was so rare and lovely. If perhaps I was not destroying a very beautiful thing. A very beautiful thing forever. Stop now. Please. Oh, please. All right. Another door. No. Oh, no. 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 And I heard the sweet voice no more. And my face was wet with tears. by William N. Robeson, directed by Norman MacDonnell, today brought you The Grove of Ashtaroth by John Buchan, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with Paul Fries as Buchan, Bill Conrad as Lawson, Kay Brinker as Ashtaroth, Raymond Lawrence as McJobson, and Eric Snowden as Travers. Music was conceived by Cy Fewer, with Eddie Dunstetter at the console. Next week. When you're tired from working all week, when the weekend offers little diversion, next week at this time, when your problems seem just too much for you, we offer you escape. <laughs> week we bring you another exciting story of high adventure. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.